biomarker, right? So that would be a biomarker in the MRI terms for precision medicine. And so far, right, so and again, this is from uh, uh, Magneton, from uh, Siemens, I believe. So this is a big drive right now, especially in the area of clinical neurology. Because no way, if you have availability of high gradients, then you can actually see how certain regions of brains are connected and interconnected with each other. And for each person, that is going to be a specific pathway. If you can determine it pretty efficiently, so you can probably derive a set of biomarkers that are derived from MRI, then perhaps you can back it up with genetic information and design the treatment after you, so to speak, highlighted the brain. So that is so, uh, so far the drive in this particular area of medical research. But can we actually translate it to the lungs? Because lungs are quite different than the it is very enigmatic organ because there is nothing in there. So most of it is like air because the void spaces and there are you know other things as well. However, lung cancer is a is a big problem, right? So it's one of the leading cause of mortality and I guess in the country like Russia with prevalence of smoking, that is probably one of the you know important things as well. So uh, how actually we go, go, go about it? So there is certain genetic predisposition to this type of disease. So, and uh, you can perform genetic analysis and then compare and then actually figure out well, which actually genetic traits leads most, most likely to, to lung cancer. But there, there, are, there are always lung cancer that just happens. And then uh, there, there are cases when you would think, well, this person has to have cancer. Right, so because they smoke 20 cigarettes a day, they they have a very very horrible lifestyle, but they have nothing. So obviously, this genetic information somehow contributes to this, and this is how we're all able to find it out. Why? Why actually do we need it, and how it is related to imaging? Well, if we have found that there is a lung cancer, then we can apply visualization techniques, different ones, to see where it is located and how actually uh, we need to. Uh, what kind of surgery we need to perform to resect it. So again, if we look at the lungs, there isn't much we can go with right now, because again, there are empty spaces. So in principle, to the very end, you wouldn't know what to do and how to do this until you open up a person. And it would be nice, very, very nice to have this information prior. So for that, we like to think that we can actually change this case that is shown over here to something better. What we can do, we can fill up these void spaces in the lung and probably highlight the areas functionally and the like where actually lung cancer is located. So to do this, this has been done quite some time ago, as you can see, but we can put uh, high class noble gases in, inside the lung and see how this area looks like. And from this highlight with high class gases, we can perhaps inform much better where a resection should happen. Again, mind that with this, you'll be also looking at the wealth of genetic data that are available, and hopefully we would be able to correlate genetic information with these uh, visualized markers that are obtainable from MRI when it's coupled to hypothesization modalities, as Professor Mansman was talking today very, very nicely in details how it's done. So, uh, uh, yeah, and we have a few gases to do this with Napsidon, right? So, well, we used to have helium-3, but unfortunately, uh, the abundant source for helium uh, is a uh, byproduct of nuclear weapons. And as we know, in our world, we try to decrease it. So, pretty much in the States, it has been announced that every available helium is a strategic resource. That means it goes for military. We can't use it for health reasons. So that's why people came up with alternative, and that was, you know, gas, global gas. And uh, um, this is probably the modality choice right now. So from what that scarce methodology that exists so far. And also, as Professor Mainsman mentioned, we also have Krypton that addresses different time scales and different details in MR image and could inform further especially when it is coupled to certain genetic information. <coughs> so there is definitely some space to develop these modalities because we do have instruments that create it. 
And, uh, but how do we integrate all this into precision medicine more efficiently? So uh, what do we have? Well, these are our instruments, right? So that's how they look like. These are the ones that produce these hypolarized gas metallurgies, uh, hypolarized gases. As you can see, they're very complicated. They're not easy. So you have a set of chemical spoils. So you have high power lasers. Here you have to deliver certain optical components to ensure that these lasers do what we want them to do and they are efficient. And on top of this, uh, we have gases, we have manifolds, we have supplies. So if someone wants uh, to operate it, you can't just push the button. You need a trained person who is going to do this. So if you are thinking about having this as your side modality in a, spot, in a hospital, again, in light of the previous talk, right? So it's just simply not going to happen, right? You can't have all these, right, plus the operator, and also think about cost efficiency of healthcare system. People will be charged for it, and that's not what we want to do. So, but just to refresh your memory, what these things do, they do this process, what Professor Medicine talked about, which is spin exchange optical pumping, which is not that safe to begin with, because you have rubidium, and uh, from chemistry experience here, we know what rubidium does, it explodes very, very efficiently, so it needs to be contained, and then you bring it in contact with the gas, with the, the, uh, with the long gas, and at the same time, you provide a lot of laser power to this little glass system that is just begging to explode if you did something wrong. So you have to keep it in mind that it's not like you can shoot it and, yeah, well, I'm fine with this, I'm, I, I do it on a regular basis, but uh, for some people it could be high to understand what's going to be going in there. So, and uh, in principle, all this trickery that is shown over here, that's what it does. It just cools your atoms, right? So and creates this favorable high polarization state when your sensitivity goes up exponentially and whatever you get into the lungs, right? So you can see where it is and you can see where it goes. So potentially it's a very, very important biomarker. So with all this beautiful physics behind and all this engineering behind, so what do we do next? How do we look at it? Yeah, well, as a physicist, I look at it and I think it is a state of the art. It's a beauty. That's what I love doing, right? So, and I know that probably most of the people in this room relate in my feelings towards it. So, and they are perfect, you know, and there are different ways how you can do this. You can do it in batch production, having this BD system. You can have them miniaturize a little bit. But all together, you know, they're open. Right, so anyone can walk on it, get exposure, and uh, it's not that easy. But now let's just do a little experiment. What if we show it to a clinical person or to a medic, and we say, look, I have this beautiful modality. How about if we install it in your hospital and we'll be doing this full diagnosis? Well, uh, the answer will be most likely no way. Right, no way this is going to be happening. This is going to be happening over my dead body. Why? Well, because there are regulations, right, so that we all need to obey. So these instruments, despite of their great potential, there are quite a few things. They, 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 they have a plan. They need to be safe. They need to be simple. They need to be push-button devices because, again, you more safety costs. You just want someone to push the button. You already have an operator who operates MRI scanner, so you don't need another person. So you need to simplify all this implementation. And of course, they need to be cheap. So these are very monumental tasks. They are not going to be sold in five minutes and ten minutes, in, in a year or two. It's a time. But we need to start somewhere, because we all believe that it's going to bring a lot of good things for people, especially in populations where lung disease are prevailing, like Russia, for example. So, uh, then, uh, uh, if we do all these uh, points that I just made, right, so precision medicine, lungs, the hospital, our instruments are no way, physics perfect, yes way. So our actually goal is to bring up the expectation level together. So we talk with each other and we dance together trying to implement all this. Because whatever I might have is my opinion, and I will tell it to my clinical collaborator, well, that's what we need to have. It does not mean that that's what they want. 
we need to listen to each other because they may have totally different goals. So, and uh, uh, thinking about these people have listened and they have done certain uh, way to bring these high polarization instruments to the to the certain to semi acceptable way. And this is one of the systems, commercial systems that we have in Nottingham. Uh, but you can see that it's not simple, right? So you have your coils, you have uh, you can close it, but in principle, it is a semi-open system. So you still need to check polarization levels, and for that, you need another set of instrumentation. So it's not that easy. So this is something uh, that we can address in here from the point of cheap, of reliable, easy, and push button. So, so far, the only thing we can say is that they're safe. So there is huge room to improve this, and uh, that's what we are trying to work on. So, Chief, how can we look at this? So, the, one of the most expensive components of a high polarizer is actually a laser. And it's not just a, a laser type array, it's just the way how you make it efficient. To make it efficient, and I'm going to talk later a little bit, so you need to make sure that the power that is generated by this array is delivered where it needs to be delivered. And that is to the spin exchange optical pumping process. And in many, many cases, it's not the case. So these lasers are very, very inefficient. And if you try to buy an efficient laser, it's going to cost you maybe 10 or uh, 20 times full. And that is not quite good. So the other way is how we collect the high polarized gaps. So, that is also uh, uh, the uh, way how we do this right now, right? So it's uh, mostly like by cryogens. And Professor Mersman talked briefly about catalytic combustion. And we think that it might be a very, very good way of cleaning up the gas. Because it's cheap, it's room temperature. Well, yeah, well, it's high temperature for 100 milliseconds, but we can all deal with the fire for, for, a, few, for a few milliseconds. And, uh, this is something that we are trying to implement uh, right now. And also, uh, the other part that we are working on is actually laser e efficiency. How we can perform these power measurements. Again, so the hospital will say, guess way, do we really want this modality? Uh, so, and uh, in this particular domain, there are you know, two ways how you can do this. You can do it through external cavity or, or, or rating, so it's pretty much similar principle, or you can do it through injection block. So right now, this is the way how it's done. And this methodology, if you want to provide stability in day-to-day -day operation to your laser, is not that cheap. So that's why there is a demand for space to decrease the, side, the cost of it, and also external gravity is something external to your laser diode array. So uh, that that actually takes some space, and you want to take it away a little bit as well. So that's why we thought that, oh yeah, and this is just a simple diagram how it's done with external gravity or with the grating. Well, the grating actually circumvents the problem of the space, but you run into another one because during high temperature, you always lose efficiency and your laser lifetime goes down quite, quite fast. So, but uh, just to, to show you about efficiency, right? So that's the inefficient laser power output that is shown over here. If you do all this trickery, and that is pretty much A, B, C, D, E, right? So you collect all this energy and you put it in a very, very, very narrow line. And that actually ensures the efficiency of your optical pumping process. So, and like I said, this is probably one of the common way, common way how it's done today. So, but there is another way. There is an injection locking that has been actually shown, you know, in principle, and it works very, very nicely. And if you talk to electrical engineers, they will tell you, well, this is the way how you should do this. Because uh, the way how laser guide arrays are built, right, so they have circular boundary conditions. So basically, if you made one of them to work at the frequency you want, the rest of them will follow. And uh, if, uh, uh, and uh, that's the basic principle behind it. So now the question is, how do you make this one to work at the frequency you want? And that is actually also has been developed very, very nicely for, for years. So in uh, uh, 
uh, disk reading technology. All these small laser dyes, they're incredibly stable and they provide this minimal power. If you tune them to the frequency, to the output frequency that you want, in this case, it's a D1 transition of the uh, of the uh, medium and vapor phase of principle, you should create very, very efficient uh, uh, laser dye array. So, and that is actually a big advantage because you could reduce potentially the cost of it 10 times. And if you have a 70,000 pound component in your system, and somehow you manage to drop it to 7,000 because the rest is not that significant, that, is, that would be a game changer just on that one. And of course, you will have 200 watts of power of a very, very narrow output. You perhaps call it a death ray if you put your finger or your eye on, 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 on the way of it. But that's something that uh, definitely to think about. And in fact, we are actually thinking about We are trying to implement this approach. So the other way how you can, you can approach uh, uh, the same problem is, well, how, how are you going to deliver all the gas? Are you going to have one facility and then provide half of the country with this? Well, simply it's not going to work. So you could take another approach. Uh, you can actually make this system modular, right? So, and disconnect it in several parts and then load it on the truck and actually drive it from one hospital to another if you need to have this gas on, on that particular in this part in that particular location. And that has been quite some, some drive and systems like this exist. There is one in the UK in the University of Sheffield and there is another one in France. I believe the French group they were the ones who started this approach. And that could be something to consider, especially if you want to do cost share. Say like you have a couple of hospitals where they all have, already have MRI scanners operating at xenon resonance frequency. So in this case, if they're originally not too far away, you might get away with one system and maybe one operator. So if you haven't evolved to the push approach uh, system yet. So anyways, uh, just to basically conclude uh, for, for these systems to be an efficient game changer in precision medicine of lungs and for the hospital to say yes way so we need to work on all these four points that I just made. So safety I think we somewhat covered, mobility is already there, costs we are getting there, simplicity and miniaturization into the next one. So if we can get these devices you know all together uh, maybe under 10, 15,000 pounds, that's something we really talk about. Because right now, commercially available system is going to cost you about three, 300,000, I believe. Okay. And, well, but again, there is another problem with this. People who work on this, and I'm sure Chimbo will be talking about this, this reliability, how reliable are they, what they produce. So to have this, so to speak, paradise, right, when you have a very reliable system that is cheap, that is mobile, that can be operated just by following the manual, we are a bit far away from that, but that's what we need. So, and, uh, um, uh, so I just want to thank you all for your attention and to conclude with this slide that shows our center in Nottingham. So it's a bit of a picture, but uh, you know, most of the people, some people who are here, you probably can recognize them. So like I said, it has been taken a few years back. But uh, yeah, so it's a very, very nice and vibrant atmosphere. The fact that we have a great opportunity to interact with our clinical health, like Shakidi, who will be talking about clinical applications with hardware and MRI. In, in lung studies, so it adds quite some value to, to our university, and of course we are very interested in establishing collaborations and uh, efficient exchange of students and uh, you know uh, common grant application programs, etc., etc. And in fact, I should mention at this point that this particular meeting is funded uh, by the British Council and Russian uh, uh, Fund of, for Fundamental Research. And that was a bilateral proposal submission because we have submitted from both sides and we've been successful. And like I said, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be back to us very much.
questions? I know it's a long story and a lot of experience, but what's your opinion in which are the fields of clinical medicine, which types of plant diseases do you expect this, this gases would be advantageous over existing modalities? Because we know that there's plenty of excellent tools to see plant diseases. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, well, like I mentioned, for precision medicine, for lung cancer, for reduction surgery, that probably will be the best because it's a dynamic measurement that you have. It's not static, right? So you can monitor what's going with the lung as people breathe, so to speak. It's not like CT where it's very difficult to get this information from. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's probably the be. The, uh, the other thing with the crypto, and we're still exploring this, uh, because uh, um, as Professor Mesman talked about this, it's uh, relaxation depends on the composition of the surface. <laughs> if your lung surface chemistry changes for whatever disease course, how it happens, certain exposure, environmental or whatever, we believe that we can catch it with that. And that would be another addition to, to, to this market because uh, you know, like environmental issues, we are just starting to scratch the surface in this area, and that could be something that we can probably explore more efficiently. So, yes, others are looking at it for as or COPD, yes. that sort of Yes, yeah. and uh, uh, yeah, so Thomas. Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. I just would like to, to comment on this. So, uh, of course, you yeah, say there are lot of excellent uh, techniques out there, but well, they are usually global. So, for many, many applications now, with COPD, and it's the checks are not really cheap. However, there are things where the technology can be Examples are um, uh, for, for surgery, lung reduction surgery, patients who can cancer. Uh, the problem is there's more occurrences. We cannot predict, we can easily measure the lung function, but we can't predict what the lung function will be when you do a surgery. So they remove parts of the lung because there are some drug use that you may or may not want to do. Exactly, uh, exactly. Exactly. And that part, what's not the lung cancer itself to do in fact, but the lung is a complicated lung surgery. And it's not that in my area of production, but uh, if you can do it, or it's not going to go into the state of pretension, it's not going to go into the state of pretension. But the other things are not So there are things, but we don't know. And of course, there's a lot of fundamental research to study lung function. I don't understand it. It's not very clear in the medical department. Yeah, and the other aspect that probably you just didn't think right away about it is um, actually when you inhale hyperline genome, it follows oxygen pathways. Mm -hmm. And you can actually, it dissolves in, in blood and it still stays hyperline, right? And it's a very potent contrast agent because nothing else resonates in the body as you know, chicken. And you can just see where it ends up, right? And depending on the lung disease or maybe other pathology that you have, you can see how it affects oxygen exchange as well. And there, there has been suggestions to use it as a brain contrast agent, believe it or not. And part of it is to use, uh, like gadolinium, it exits out of the body, it doesn't get accumulated because it's the same as gas, it's like oxygen, it doesn't hang down the rain. Yeah. Yes. I guess, please. Thanks for my presentation. My question is, is it possible or not? Combine this nice, precise, uh, in time, uh, CT monitoring with, for example, therapy or surgery. Yeah. Do you have some examples? So. I don't have the examples, but maybe Thomas will show some examples. Sorry, what was the combination of the therapy? Basically, the follow up therapy has to be placed in the monitor or yeah. So the radiation therapy. Yeah, so I mean, that would be one thing. I mean, is, is a patient responding 
Simpler methodology because xenon is just one uh, atom, right? So while in uh, carbon fifteen DNP you deal with the molecule, and the second you go to more complex system that keeps your high polarization. There is more interaction that gets everything gets depolarized. With the gas when it sits in the whole space, there isn't much happening. So the time scale is such that it is much by far much more forgiving. So from that point of view. Uh, that bit is actually not too bad. On, oh, on top of this, when it dissolves in the tissues, you still have a few seconds to go, which is nice on the MR time scale. And uh, when you try to track pathways and where it then up, it might not be reproducible because uh, to the extent that uh, it's held different other things. But I think uh, if you just want to answer the question, if your general physiology is fine, or not fine, and whether or not you have a response to treatment or you don't, I think it's, it's pretty well. I mean, in my opinion, it's much better than the DNP, but Professor Kumar, who will be here tomorrow, I'm sure he will explain it much better than, than I can. Were you thinking of the technical reproducibility or, or the response? Because of course, the key issues in getting these techniques to work. A lot of that's been sorted out. Um, a question of whether it's the technique itself or it's actually the biological response in which it, it is reproducible. I think it swings both ways because yeah. there's some, some, there are some technical issues, purely technical issues, and the coils, because with different coils, you get absolutely different results in the spice of pyrogate, which we imagine comes with the team. And you know, in the very same patients we observe when we're doing a number of um, studies, using the same coil, the same magnet. Same parameter, you know, the spikes are different, significantly different from each other. You know, the same tumors over the course of a week. So, you know, that's what we've been wondering about. That's one of the issues. Yeah, so I think Zenon is more forgiving that way. Yeah. Okay, Galina, I think we should leave there. Don't go away, I'll be back. more translation skills are all to be needed. All right. Thank you. I've called upon Gladys Lachenko with some announcements. 
Or if not, uh, <laughs> somewhere else. He's not here. Uh, we should punch him, he's just arriving. Oh, so okay. we're waiting for him in a few minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can, I can. And keep I, talking, I, I can, Yeah, I can, I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, again, uh, as you see the wall over here, right, so this has been funded by the British, and uh, this is just for younger audience, please. So for not established scientists, right? Um, so uh, it has been funded by British Council, and it just so, so, because we set that meeting up here, so we just uh, ended up in some surplus of money that we actually wanted to fund some certain scientific projects that you guys perhaps can come up during time course of this workshop to come out to the University of Nottingham for about a couple of months or two months to be precise and to work with uh, scientists you know in our establishment so as you know tomorrow so we have carbon uh, we have dnp you know kit we have uh, high polarization kits so we have a clinical facility where you can develop a physics facility so there there is a variety of projects so if you just uh, write it up so what you wanted to do why you wanted to do and submit it you know as a word file to the organizing committee we hope to consider it and basically let know the winners uh, by the end of this workshop so we thought it would be a very very good idea as well because uh, you know it just so happened that uh, we were time restricted when we could organize this workshop and for uh, british side it's not a good time literally so, because uh, of the holidays, schools, and teaching, and all this stuff. So, that's why we hoped if uh, you guys, uh, the young ones, could come out, you will have extra opportunity to develop certain interactions and uh, certain network, and uh, basically uh, to try to work on projects, see how it is done, uh, pick up some skills, and uh, hopefully it will be something very useful that you perhaps you be thinking about building um, in this country. And we've also thought that if we start exchanging in these platforms, that would be very, very useful for, for everyone. And of course, uh, you know, we're more than welcome project submissions from all the cities, from all the universities. So if you know someone else who would like actually to participate in this, please just do it. So I'm sure we we put up an update here. Yeah, that would be very, very nice, and uh, we, we hope that, uh, um, you know, that you will go along with this. <laughs> so that's the, the public announcement. So just make sure you submit it by the end of this work. Technically speaking. Okay? So, uh, yeah. Uh, any, any other questions? I mean, about logistics or about... Does anybody from the young audience has any questions about this program which was just announced? Okay, so if you have any questions or if you want to participate, you can just contact Salina directly. Or organize it. Yeah. Do you want to say how well, many of these and how much? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I can. I can. Well, all right. So to to basically, uh, yeah. So um, um, the way how it will work. So. Most likely, the sending side will pay for the tickets for the airfare, and then when you come to Nottingham, we will provide you with accommodation and some, you know, money so you can give you 200 pounds a week so you can buy food and stuff. So, yeah. so that sort of thing. And we thought that maybe for for two months, right? So, but uh, mind that perhaps you might want to, to achieve something when you pay for it. It's not just to, to check in, to check out folks around and stuff and local beers and ages. Which is also very, very good and entertaining exercise. Yeah? Okay, thank you for the talk. Yeah. So uh, now colleagues uh, we have uh, some time to Excellent. Uh, speak about our future program. Um, besides the, the Moscow University, we have also beautiful city around, and we want you to to have fresh impressions of the city. So we made some um, cultural programs for the participants. 
and uh, if you look at your program, uh, you could notice that we had a slight change uh, of the program in the morning, so we shifted a little bit some uh, lectures. But uh, generally, we uh, are expecting to continue our sessions in the order which is provided in the program. So after the lunch, everything will be like in program. It, uh, only uh, Professor uh, Sinisa will speak uh, at uh, number three. The lecture number three will be after the lunch. Uh, for uh, today evening, uh, we did schedule a special program, a special excursion for the participants. So this is for those who are already registered. So if you are not registered person, uh, you can come to the organizing committee and we shall try to manage this situation and to try to take you with us. Uh, uh, you this session. Huh? Evening session. Yes, we call it evening session, but everyone knows what is it is about. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's said that it's most Caribbean Red Square excursion. So we try to combine both, and we are very lucky that we have good or great weather, and uh, we are going to join the uh, celebration of the birthday of city of Moscow, which is going to be on the next uh, on this weekend. So and so we shall see all the preparations and all this stuff you know, for this festivity. Uh, so uh, as you know, as we are going to, to go to the river, uh, it may be a, a bit freezing because it's water around and uh, after the sunset it might be a bit freezing. So uh, we would like uh, to, uh, to advise you to have well, not not a coat, but just something over over top, if you if, if you want. If you are a strong person who is not, you know, I, I, we don't think it will be less than 15 degrees Celsius, so uh, it, it's more or less comfort, comfortable. And uh, uh, the thing is uh, uh, that uh, after the uh, after the evening session, after not evening, but the afternoon session. Uh, we have uh, some spare time, which is about uh, one hour uh, uh, before the uh, bus transfer to the uh, river road. And uh, we uh, thought that it might be useful for you to use it to go to your hotel and to take your coats or whatever not. But I was told that most of you did already took them with you. Is it right? Does anybody who needs to go for his coats after the afternoon session? Yeah. You need it. I need to go. Okay. Well, the, the, why I'm asking about this? Uh, we did schedule that the transfer, the bus transfer will start from the main building of Moscow State University. But it's quite a way to walk. It's about 20 minutes to walk. And uh, we can rearrange it so that nobody will go away from this place and the bus will pick up right here. So the same, uh, uh, so you have to mention in your program that the bus will leave from this building the time scheduled in the program. It's 16.20, okay? So no, not main building, but from this point. Okay. 16:20, like in a program. Okay. Uh, and uh, for tomorrow morning, for tomorrow afternoon, uh, we have uh, the excursion to the main building of the Moscow State University. And uh, because it's uh, a very uh, small space on the top of this building. So uh, we uh, arranged this excursion to those who came outside of the Moscow State University. So for our guests, for the guests of Moscow State University. And all those who are from Moscow State University, uh, they can uh, go there on their own or on other days if they want. But if they want to ask us how to get there, they can come to the organizing committee. So uh, for tomorrow, uh, 
afternoon or uh, uh, midday excursion. So uh, part of the conference, which are guests of Moscow State University, they will go for the excursion. And other people will have their uh, free time, free time for discussions or whatever not. And after that, uh, at, uh, we shall have lunch. The lunch will be in the uh, main building of the Moscow State University. Okay. So if anyone does not know where to go, or those who are from Moscow State University, for example, they can ask us as well. And after the lunch tomorrow, we shall move uh, back to this uh, building. So don't get lost at this time. Uh, and uh, tomorrow evening, we have a, a special uh, reception at the British Embassy. Uh, uh, there is a list of persons who are already admitted there. Uh, if you want to join, we can try to organize this as well, but you have to tell us today. So the transfer was, will be also from this building tomorrow. Uh, the problem is that uh, the British Embassy did ask us that we shall have a non-casual style, but better like business style. So like costume, or like, you know, so business style dressing. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you have to prepare before because uh, we won't have any spare time after the afternoon session tomorrow. Okay, so be aware of this. And uh, on the third day, uh, we shall have a midday excursion, so afternoon excursion to the laboratory of magnetic uh, uh, resonance and a magnetic uh, MRI laboratory, which is headed by Professor Pirakov. And afterwards, uh, uh, in the uh, afternoon, we shall have a, a session which will take place not in this building, so it will be uh, in the physics department, which is uh, not far from here. Uh, so this is for you to know that the last session is not in this place. Okay. So don't get lost. After the excursion, we shall go to the physics department. Then. And what will be the, mm, the, the final point to which we all I approaching is our conference dinner. We will take part in a different place from our lunch. Okay. And uh, the thing is that this dinner will coincide with the fireworks which are dedicated to the holiday of the Moscow city. And uh, this is uh, somehow also dedicated to our uh, beautiful workshop. So we have all possible uh, things at our disposal. Uh, so, uh, for now, uh, we are going to have lunch. Okay. Uh, the lunch uh, starts at about uh, 1 o'clock p.m. sharp and ends about 1 hour. The lunch is just in the same place where we have the coffee break. So for today, it is like this. And before this, I would like to ask all of you, as we are all here just met, we want to have a group photo in front of the entrance of this building. We have great weather, we have great audience here, we have great speakers, and I hope everything here will be great. Thank you for attention, and see you at the photo.